Hello and welcome to Live at 7 here on CBM TV, the exclusive home of the 2014 FIFA World Cup. It's Friday, May 30. Thanks for watching us on CBM and around the globe online at cbmtv.com. I'm Simon Crosskill. This evening we present a Live at 7 special examining the aliens among us. You can join our discussion by chatting with us on Facebook, we're live at 7 CBM TV, or send a tweet to live at 7 JA. Now, Jamaica is used to invaders of all kinds, be they human, animal, or plant. This island has seen them all. And as is the case with invasions, the results are not normally positive. Here now is part one of the aliens among us. <laughs> an alien attack. It sounds funny when you say it like that, but the reality is it's no laughing matter. Not to the thousands of Jamaicans who are now contending with the loss of livelihoods as a result, and by extension, the rest of us who are now witnessing the loss of animals and plants that were here before the arrival of our poor parents. For the past several years, customers have been complaining. The shrimp just tastes different. And they're right. It tastes different because it is different. It's not the shrimp that we once fished from out the Black River. They are being removed by the alien species, the Australian red claw crayfish. The shrimpers call it these tough back shrimps is eating is the soft shell one. So eventually we need a, a lot of regulation on the shrimps, but it is hard to regulate. So we have to try to work with it. Just this morning when we were coming down, Miss Chung and I were discussing this the red clawed lobster is one of those that has been uh, pushing aside our native species of shrimp and it's only a matter of time possibly before out at middle quarters you won't be getting many of our indigenous shrimp but most of it might be the red claw lobster which doesn't taste as good at all shrimp in middle quarters is serious business this is a prepared pack of shrimp. I've already washed it before you come along, so I'm about to put on the pot on the fire and put the shrimp in it. But I beat the pepper, the salt is there, and the water is there. But you just use a little bit of water because the shrimp have so. water, a lot of water. So when you put the shrimp in the pot, it makes a lot of water come in the pot. But the shrimp business is not like it was once upon a time. And that's obvious for the naked eye to see. Gone are the throng of shrimp sellers ready to share their goodies with the eager shrimp buying public. As a matter of fact, gone are the buyers that used to make traveling through middle quarters on your way back to Black River a monumental headache as the traffic would crawl to an annoying halt while the shrimp buyers pulled over to get their shrimp fix. Oh my god, you have people all over the world come to have shrimp in middle quarters. Middle quarters shrimp. Middle quarters shrimp is the best shrimp worldwide. Not even the fishermen are seeing shrimp like in the past. Mm, both um, um, five to yes. I know far you have to row your boat. About, about uh, a mile or so. And you don't catch not even one swim. I get about a half a pound, a pound, a half a pound or so. See, then you go river for a morning. Right. This, this is what he catch. Mm -hmm. He catch him poor. Poor. And another time, another time again, he plenty full. Yeah. This is, is what he catch from money. This is, this barely can mine his farm belly. But he have to mm -hmm. go, a go with it. It's a struggle. It's left the shrimpers worried as they don't know what's next. But how did the red claw crayfish get here in the first place? They come from Australia. How did they get here? Um, a lady in Olava was raising the shrimps and I heard that the farm it was a storm and it overflow and it come right down to St. Elizabeth from Clarendon. And now it's flourishing and literally taking over in the Black River. Start to breed up a lot in the river. Yeah, the tough shell one. Then. And the meat is a different piece of meat? Around. Yeah, the meat is very, a little hardish more, but it, it is nice. It is nice, to be honest. And there's no way you can stop them now? No, no. No way you can stop it again. That's one of the traits with, um, with invasives. They tend to be very hardy and can reproduce very, very quickly or in um, vast numbers. The Australian red claw crayfish and suckermouth catfish are alien invasive species. And today they're preying on and flourishing in the Black River Lower Morass. In fact, 
the Black River Lower Morass could be termed ground zero for these alien attackers. Alien invasive species are plants, animals and other microorganisms which are introduced deliberately or unintentionally into an area where they do not naturally occur. The introduction and or spread of these species threatens other living things. And it's not just animals that have made the Black River their breeding ground. Alien plants are doing very well there as well, threatening the Black River and everybody who earns off it. Live at Seven was a part of a media tour of the Lower Black River Morass arranged by the National Environment Planning Agency, NEPA. NEPA, in conjunction with the UA Mona's Life Sciences Department, have been waging a war against the alien species. And Dr. Kurt McLaren, senior lecturer in the Life Sciences Department, has been the point man on the waterways of the Black River, so much so that residents have lovingly dubbed him Swamp Man. It's a Ramsar site of international significance and it could easily be um, have a, um, be one of them sites that um, are, it is a site that is human. It's owned by the Government of Jamaica and the Petroleum Corporation of Jamaica, the PCJ. It covers just about 14,000 acres or 5.7 meters and supports a rich indigenous flora and fauna with several of the species there being endemic to Jamaica. These include the only native representative of the Brazil nut family, the swamp palm and the touch palm, as well as the Naysbury bullet. The touch palm is used extensively in the making of baskets and as roofing material. The southern section of the lower morass contains relatively large strands of red mangrove, which supports various species of birds, crabs, fish, shrimp, and the American crocodile. It also serves as a hatchery for many species of fish in their juvenile stages, provides a nesting area for various birds, and generates an abundance of nutrients for bottom feeders, like crabs, lobsters, as well as fish, such as mangrove snapper, snook, and mullet. Swamplands are also helpful in absorbing the shock of tidal waves caused by hurricanes and protect the inland areas. It's described as the best area in Jamaica for all water birds. It is known to be the only area where the flamingo still nests occasionally. But with all the value, it's been attacked by outsiders. These include plants like the water hyacinth, the wild ginger, and the Australian paperbark tree. It is well known, but I don't think it's appreciated. I think that's a problem because even if you speak to people from, um, if you speak to the, the locals, they don't really recognize, they don't even realize how important it is. Um, but it's not that well known. People just know it says Black River Morass, Crocodile, Swamp, and that's it. Because I mean, even people just call me Swamp Man or some, some like that. Cause, I mean, that's what they associate with um, the Black River. But it's very important. It's even important for like you know, ecotourism. You guys saw that. Mm. Um, so the country could potentially, I mean, if it's developed properly, there is a lot we can actually do or gain from an area like this. Mm -hmm. The paperbark tree is not just a problem in Jamaica. The U.S. have been battling it in the Florida Everglades for years. They call it the paperbark tree because when you grab that bark, it just flakes off. So it can uh, resist any kind of burning. So burning doesn't affect it. From our estimate, our estimation, we spoke to a, um, we spoke to a couple of fishermen, um, shrimp fishermen, and they're saying that it's been here probably about the last 20 years, 20, 25 years. But what exactly are the issues with the Australian paperbark? tree? The issue with this plant is that um, it's a major problem in the U.S. in the Florida Everglades and it has basically taken over most of the Everglades and the U.S. government has have spent more, uh, many millions of dollars trying to control it. Problem is that whenever it gets out it actually um, takes over a particular area and it displaces the vegetation creates a dense cover and as you can see it can, it's, it's fire resistant. It has a lot of problems with um, the whole hydrology of the, um, the morass and it could actually affect um, the availability of um, even water and stuff like that. We produce very fast you know because you can barely see it has those little has some little pods on it those pods most of at part one tree holds over two million seed, seeds and what it does is that it stores the seeds and um, whenever there's mechanical damage whenever there's a fire or anything it just disperses its seeds so it can spread fairly rapidly. So now we're fighting back and reaping some success against the paper bark tree. They use some herbicides. Um, they, there's a common herbicide called Roundup. 
that seems to work is we use a method called a frill and girdle where you cut the trees until you can see the um, beyond the box so you can see the cambium or where the, um, the tissues that it uses to move water and food up and down and then we have a spray bottle with um, either a dilute solution or a full con concentration of um, herbicides and we spray it on the trunk. So the herbicides that we found that worked was um, a herbicide called um, Arsenal and there's another one called um, and Roundup of course works. You have to remember that Jamaica have a long history where people have brought in ornamentals and stuff and they've established places like the Blue Mountains and even out here we'll see the Alpina where the Alpina has established and you can't get rid of it, you can only control it. But this is, a, this is one case where we can actually eliminate it. But while we're capable of winning the fight against the paperback tree, the water hyacinth, wild ginger, the suckermouth catfish and of course the red claw crayfish remain problems. This is the other invasive plant. This is the, um, we call it alpinia. It's the invasive ginger. It's from Southeast Asia. Um, it's been established for some time now, um, but it's one of the species that we can't get rid of. We only can control it, so we have to work out where it will expand and progress. Behind it is what we call a swamp forest patch. It's one of the last remaining swamp forest patches in, on the entire island. There's about 20 of them in the morass. Um, this is one of them. This one was invaded by the, um, the ginger. When I first came here in 2004, 2005, this entire patch expanded, um, was, came all the way up there. And a hurricane came, blew off the top, and the ginger basically took over. And the ginger is basically knocking on the door of that patch over there. And there's other patches that it's basically very close to. So it will take over the patches. So we have to work out how to control them, control the ginger. Um, because essentially, if we don't control it, all that, that you'll see in the entire morass is this. And nothing can grow below it or anywhere near it. So that was established by a seed dropping in the water, going down and established, um, germinating and it, it established here. So when we're looking here, this could be all just one plant because it has underground roots that run all the way across and they just send up shoots, send up shoots. And when you pull them up, you'll see it. It's just one entire root with just nothing but shoots coming up. This is about, um, over, about roughly about, I'd say about 1% of the entire lower morass. But it's, it's, it's spreading really, really fast. I mean, it spread between 2009 and 2014. It, um, it moved about 5 meters. It spread about 5 meters. So that, um, I mean, it doesn't sound like much. Uh, but 5 meters is a lot for plants. As we're talking about wherever it is, just picture it expanding five meters away from where it is. It's an appreciation at the top um, for natural resources. Uh, should mention it here, part of the, the issue is when you look at things, places like Gota. Mm -hmm. So there's a lack of appreciation for our natural resources. Um, but there is, there at some levels, um, there's a recognition that these areas are important because there's a move now to declare this as a protected area. But um, anyway. <laughs> there's moves now to declare this as a protected area, but there's a lot of issues that need to be solved. There's unfortunately the whole things like with the goat island undermines the whole of what we're trying to do or what we're trying to accomplish. Because if that is a protected area and the government can just go back into a protected mm -hmm. area and destroy it, it just means that it's, it's actually no real protection for anywhere. Mm -hmm. We take a short break. We'll be back with the Live at 7 special, The Aliens Among Us, in just a moment. Welcome back to uh, Live at 7 and our special report, The Aliens Among Us. Now, it's not just Black River that is invasion central. Our seas are being attacked as well by a rather voracious, if beautiful, predator. Here again is Yolande Giles Levy with part two of The Aliens Among Us.
creatures, beautiful though they may be in appearance, they're as deadly as they come. The invaders of our seas, the lionfish, fit that bill. Native to the Indo-Pacific Ocean and the Red Sea, nobody really knows how the lionfish got on this side of the world. But it's been speculated that a Florida aquarium which housed lionfish was destroyed by Hurricane Andrew in 1992, causing the release of the fish into the Atlantic. And since then, the lionfish have been menacing the entire region. The first sighting of the lionfish was off the coast of Trelawney in 2006. It's a very serious problem and it's a good thing that we actually acted on it and acted so well because it can have very, very serious implications, especially for us as an island. It can have cascading effects on the marine ecosystems. Um, so if you have this lionfish invading your, your reef and it's taking over and it's consuming approximately 20 or so li juvenile lionfish at one feeding, that is removing maybe 20 to 40 juvenile landfish um, local species. Now, if you imagine they reproduce every four days and one female landfish can uh, produce up to 2 million eggs annually. Now, if you do the math, that is a l serious issue we would have to deal with. So it can have cascading effects in terms of it consuming a lot of our herbivorous fish, such as a part fish, um, that actually help to maintain the health of the coral reefs. Now, as an island, we depend a lot on coral reefs, things from um, storm surges, when hurricane season come around. Even in tourism, it affects us. So we do have a lot of um, tourists coming here to do scuba diving, even snorkeling, and they enjoy our, the, the, the beauty of our reefs. Jamaica has been one of the few countries in the region that have been aggressive about taming the aquatic beast, and with good reason. A lionfish is a marine invasive species, meaning it outcompetes the native species for habitat, space, it also consumes pretty much everything in the ocean so and it focuses a lot on the juvenile fish and small adults so if you remove the babies of the sea then they won't grow up to be any adult fishes and in turn you know that will put a stump on the whole reproductive cycle so it may have negative impacts on our fish stocks um, which unfortunately is overfished so we certainly want to remove those land fish to um, at least help maintain the whatever fish stock we have left. We tell our fisher folk, listen, when you go out there to remove land fish,